This episode of Torpreneur is sponsored by Fair Harbor. Fair Harbor fuels the experiences of the travel industry with the most comprehensive online reservation system available for tours, activities, and attractions. Visit fairharbor.com to see why over 15,000 businesses worldwide trust Fair Harbor to better serve their customers and increase online bookings. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. And welcome to episode 145 of Tourpreneur. We are talking all about blogging for tour operators. We welcome back Doreen Wharton. How are you, Doreen? I'm great. How are you, Shane? Fantastic. We had wonderful feedback about our first session where we talked a lot about mindset behind blogging. And uh, I've been nagged by many of our listeners to say, hey, when's the next installment of blogging for tour operators? You know, it's one of these things I think the vast majority of operators, we love creating content. It's a fun part of the job, especially when at this time of recording, we can't, or most of us are not leading tours. Next best thing is creating content, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. So what have you got in store for us today? What are we going to be looking at? Well, we were going to talk about three things, what to write about how to organize what you found so it's manageable and not overwhelming, and then where to also find those topics online. Very important what to write about, because I think all of us that have blogged, we come across writer's block, right? I guess it's bloggers block, even where you sit down to write something and think, okay, what should I be writing about? So what tips have you got for us in terms of what we should be writing about? Well, first of all, it doesn't have to be writing either. Right. So it can be video, it can be audio, it can be an infographic, you know, how those nice diagrams of a particular topic that could be done. A picture gallery is also, you could also make that into a blog. So it doesn't have to just be limited to writing. I think that's an excellent point. And it's something that many of us are guilty of. We just say, oh, I'm going to create a video today and go shoot a video. Or I've got this idea about what I want to write about without thinking that, okay, start with the focus first rather than the format. So if, for instance, you're like, okay, I want to record a video where I'm talking all about what to pack on a visit to uh, Burlington, Vermont in April, because believe it or not, it's snowing right now. (laughs) Um, That might be better suited to a blog than a video. You know, that's not necessarily going to fit an Instagram reel. Uh, It might fit an Instagram story. So I often think that thinking about the focus of the content first and then, okay, what format is going to fit that? So you're absolutely right. I will often talk about blogging as writing, but there are all these different formats that might actually work better than the written word. Yeah, and it wouldn't even have to be a whole video either. You could do clips within and then write about a little bit about each section. So you really have a lot of options when it comes to blogging. What else have you got on that for us? So what else? Okay, well, here's the big one. You definitely have to think of before you do anything, just think about who you're targeting. Yes. So who's really your audience? Because you're going to inevitably produce something and think, oh, this is really just something I would be interested in, (laughs) not anyone else. So, So have that in mind first. And then write about what your guests ask you about. That's probably the easiest place to start because we all want to create content that's useful for someone. Think about it, it like if you start a brain dump in your own mind as to what you could potentially start writing about, start with the questions that past guests have asked you about. Or they told you some things about, so say, for example, they're traveling in Vermont. Inevitably, you've talked to those people and they were talking about other things that they've done, things that they liked when they were visiting. Just write a brainstorm dump of that kind of stuff um, onto a piece of paper because that, that is a really good place to start. Yeah, I agree with you. Those inbound questions are an absolute goldmine. And, you know, to be honest, it's how I operate to a printer. When people write to me and say, hey, um, you know, how do I start blogging? How do I start with Instagram reels? It's my audience telling me what they want to read or hear about. Uh, and it's absolute gold, isn't it? It's probably the best content you will ever create. I mean, there's a point where you go, oh, I've already written about that or I've done that. So it's a perfect place to start. and it's probably the most useful information that ever uses content. But here's the interesting thing. I've had tour operators say to me, 
well, I don't really know my customer. And all of a sudden they realize, oh yeah, I actually really do because there was this guy and he was talking about really enjoying this and they like to do this. It's really quite interesting because you might start out thinking you don't actually know what your customer wants. But when you think about it a little bit more, you think about that conversation you had with a guy on a tour and he mentioned this. So it's surprising what you'll find just by thinking about the conversations that you've had with guests. Definitely. And also not just, uh, you know, what's coming in by email, but, you know, ask your guides, you know, what are customers asking you when they're on the tour or, you know, what are some of the, the, the snags? For instance, you know, one of my frustrations is when I can't find the meeting point and then you get frustrated and flummoxed thinking I'm going to miss my tour because there's two of these shops or whatever on this one street. And it's like, oh, crikey, we hadn't thought about that because... I think we're all guilty as this as content creators. We live in a bubble and we expect people to know that shop A is at the West end of the street, not the East end. And it could be that that is a, you know, an issue and a frustration that customers experience. There you go. There's a blog post for you as well as putting yeah, that information you can on the website. Blog post about the most, you know, frustrating questions our customers always ask. The sky's really the limit. I mean, I think I would, that's a classic example actually of talking about, the focus because I think if that was happening to my tour, I'd want to record a funny video. So you can actually visually see the two meeting places or the shop. Let's say it's Smith's shop and there's two of them on that. Um so that you can actually make a funny video about it. I think that would be cool. That yeah, absolutely. Here's another thing that you should write about is your interests because you want to write about things that you're interested in that are related to your topic because it's going to keep you motivated to keep on doing your blog. And I like, uh, actually, Mitch Bach from Trip School. He mentioned something recently. I don't know that guy. Yeah, me neither, but he (laughs) he had some good things to say. (laughs) He actually said passion posts and conversion posts, like do both. Because the passion stuff is going to keep you alive and interested in the things that you want to do. And then there's also, you know, things that are related to the purpose of your business, which can be very much passion posts. But then also there's other ones that are going to convert the, you know, the how to do this the top things, those are conversion posts. So do both. Absolutely. I also say, look at your own reading online or your own viewing. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to the travel industry. So for instance, I read a lot of soccer stuff and I also read a lot to do with investing. And if you look at investment sites, I mean, they are all trying to get eyeballs on their content because they want you to pay for subscriptions and so forth. Maybe there is something in their content. You think, oh, that's a really good headline. How can I adapt that for my activity or tour as well? So not just to think travel, 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 but examine your own reading or scan through your local newspaper. You know, what headlines stand out for you and ask yourself, well, why does that headline appeal to me? I wouldn't veer too far away from your category because there's a thing that Google looks at on your website, which is related content. So when something is completely off the mark, that's very different, your ability to rank is going to be tough. I'm not suggesting that, but what I'm saying is look for ideas. Maybe that in those blog posts of, say, an investment site, you know, the 10 top tools uh, or the 10 10 best platforms for buying stocks could be, okay, well, I'm going to put, you know, the 10 best platforms for booking tours or whatever it may be, but adapting that to your content Ah, when you're struggling for ideas is what, what are other people doing? I think sometimes we just look at our own vertical within travel instead of being more holistic or even looking at funny enough health, holistic health and fitness, you know, what are those guys writing about and how can you adapt that to your own topic? No, no, definitely stay on topic. Don't be writing about stocks and shares. If you're having a walking tour of Montreal, that's, that's not what I meant, but just to be inspired by other people's content, always be learning, right? That's my mantra. It's like, be open-minded. Go, what can I learn from this? I can apply to my own, uh, my own content creation. And then of course, the third thing is related topics that people are actually searching for. So that's where the internet, our friend called the, you know, the intraweb becomes our very best friend because there's a lot of free ways that we can find information that's also golden. Absolutely. No, I agree. What advice would you give to an operator who's just starting out? So they don't have inbound questions yet because they're they're building their tour right now, ready for the recovery. Uh, They obviously haven't had any customers yet. What advice would you give to that operator? Well, so let's go right into what you can find on the internet. And this applies to whether you're new or you've had your business for quite some time. I've got at least 10 ways that you can find really good information. The first one would be 
you want to look at a combination of keywords but and topics as well. Because a keyword isn't necessarily a whole topic in itself. It might be an idea and then you actually add a topic. Then it's also a really good keyword that you could write about. There's a couple of really good mind maps out there. So there's a, there's a website called answerthepublic.com. It's a really cool site. I, have you been on it, Shane? No, I haven't. It's hilarious when you look at the homepage because there's a guy, this guy that's looking at you. He's looking at what you're typing. It's really quite funny. But say, for example, you put in, you know, Ottawa Bike Pass. In Ottawa, Canada, they, they, do, they do a lot of biking there. It will spit out a mind map of the different questions that people are asking related to that particular topic. This website, it limits the number of searches you have, but there's also SEM Rush also has a really good mind map as well. So pick a term of some kind. I mean, start with your category and then see what kind of questions people are asking. And you'll find some really interesting pieces of content there that you could write a blog post, or you could also use it for other means. I mean, you could write it for your, use it for your FAQs for your website. That's a really good place to start. The other one would be, of course, Google. So Google Suggest. So you know when you're searching on something with Google, you type out a word. Don't press return, though. So when you don't press return, you see all the related words that come down. Those are what people are searching for, right? Those are the things that are related to a particular topic that you put in there. So um, really good place to start. Same with Google Images, because you could take that same word, click on Images on Google, and then there's the, uh, the tags at the top of Google, like there's a little bubble things, which are related words that relate to that main word that you put in there. That could also be the start of an idea, the start of a, a topic that you might write about. And of course, those are free. So those, those tags can be really useful. And then um, Google also has a section when you, if say again, you type the very same word, you scroll down to the very bottom of Google and it has uh, searches related to and it's like a little section there. Those are long tail keywords, which are a great place to start with writing content. So Google is, we can love them and hate or hate them, <laughs> but they're really, they've got the best search tool in my view ever. Absolutely. So they're really good free options. Totally endorse that. Let's say I do have some money to invest. And as you mentioned, keywords really important. What keyword tools do you recommend? So I personally use Key Search. I've been using it for years because, well, a few reasons. It's, it's probably the most inexpensive on the market. I think it's maybe $17 a month. But what I would like to do is I, I look at backlinks. I, I look at my competitors, how they're ranking in terms of keywords. And then I also look at their backlinks because that shows me, hey, these guys wrote an article. How do you do that? So a lot of those keyword tools, you have, have a a backlink search kind of capability. So it allows you to see what they've been featured in. It's multi-purpose because then you can say, oh, you know, I need a backlink for my website and they were featured on a certain publication. How could I get featured on that too? But again, that's an impetus for another potential article you could write that's related to that topic because it's obviously popular if they've been, you know, if they've had a backlink for it too. Yeah. And some of these keyword tools, I mean, I've looked around some of them are bloody expensive, right? Something like a hundred dollars a month. I think, I think Ahrefs or, or some of them are, are very expensive tools. So one for 17 bucks a month is uh, definitely the budget option. Yeah. It's done everything that I've ever wanted. I mean, I, I will on a K, I will go to SEM rush too, because it, it is more robust, but for someone that's doing blogging for their own business and you want to look at a whole bunch of keywords, and then you also want to see what your competitors are doing, you want to track the progress of your keywords. Key search is good. It's never failed me. Great. I have to check that out. You, you mentioned competitors, and I think also that's something else I would suggest. So if I'm just starting out and waiting for restrictions to be lifted so I can get out there and lead a tour, let's say I have a walking tour in Montreal, I would then Google walking tours in New York, walking tours in London, and look at my competitors in other cities. I say competitors, but walking tours in other cities and go, oh, what content... Exactly. in that vertical and like, what content are they? Well, actually you can get competitors in your own city as well. But, you know, if you look at everyone else and say, okay, so here's a walking tour in London. What are they? Wow. They're blogging a lot. What are they blogging about? Um, a really good example of that was I was looking at Rob Patingalo's triphacksdc.com and 
you know, so let's say I'm I'm stuck for ideas here, and he's got you know one blog post here, six common DC myths and misconceptions. DC is just a bunch of government buildings. We all hang out at the Lincoln Memorial. DC weather is always nice. And it's a really fun article. We see the president all the time. Uh, And then he also writes another blog post, five overrated DC attractions that you can skip. So, you know, this is really good, you know, why you should stay in downtown DC. This is really good insider stuff. Things that I'd want to know if I was visiting uh, Washington, D.C. Rob also creates videos around these as well. But just looking at that blog post, if I'm stuck and I've got my walking tour and I can say, well, here, I can write five overrated Montreal attractions that you can skip. Why can't I write that? You know, so it's inspiration for you as well. Well, speaking of video, here's another great way to find top videos out there related to your niche. Go to YouTube, look at your competitors, look at the same niche as well, and then just do a search of their most popular videos. So you can you can change the um, the navigation on there to look at most popular videos and then see what are their most popular videos. Hey, maybe I should do that too, or write about it, or do a picture gallery about it, or something. Again, also free. Got a quick message from one of our sponsors, and then we'll get right back to today's show. Stay tuned. Your search for the industry's best online reservation system is over. Fair Harbor enables thousands of tour and activity businesses across the globe with streamlined experiences that convert website visitors into paying customers to strategically increase online bookings and overall revenue. Their highly customizable cloud-based booking solutions are designed to be easy for you and your customers. Fair Harbor eases every aspect of your day-to-day operations through one easy-to-use dashboard. Options like custom seat maps and online seat selection can all be tailored to your unique needs, while capacity limits and contactless mobile ticket scanning help you maintain the latest safety protocols. All of this alongside Fair Harbor's best-in-class 24-7 support. Visit fairharbor.com to see why over 15,000 tour, activity, and attraction businesses choose Fair Harbor. We really are blessed, aren't we, in this day and age to have access to all this information. I, I feel for those marketeers of 20 years ago that were sat there with no internet and having to come up with a newspaper ad or a creative or an advertorial. I mean, if you think about how much information we have at our fingertips, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, we used to have to wait because I, I happen to be one of those people in that generation. We had to wait till our books arrived because we'd buy research. And you had to wait for like, every four months, you would get this book delivered to your desk of research and how people are like the classic funnel that we talk about. We had to get that on from a report that only came out, you know, every four months. You're basically feeling like you're running blind. And, you know, we never imagined we would have this kind of information at our fingertips. And I know sometimes we think, you know, there's content overwhelm, but this is a huge positive that, you know, from the comfort of your own home or from your, te- I almost said telephone, then, <laughs> so it's my age, from your phone, that you can go and, and find this information out. And, you know, just looking at Trip Hacks's blog there, that will give you ideas. Um, the other one I was looking at was uh, Brian at Crawl New Orleans, and he has things like, Things to do in New Orleans 2021. New Orleans, is it safe to travel? Six must-try New Orleans frozen drinks. Eight most haunted places in New Orleans. Five reasons to take a New Orleans haunted ghost tour. So, you know, really cool things that I would... I think the key thing here is as a traveler, I would find this valuable information and interesting information. It's not, hey, book my tour, book my tour. One of my frustrations, and I actually said this at the arrival masterclass, and I might be veering off topic here, but share other people's content. Don't always make it about you. So for instance, if I'm running my walking tours in Montreal, I might want to highlight a really cool Scottish pub that's in Montreal. I might go there, take a funny video or create content around it because that's still useful content for the people who are coming to Montreal. And I go, oh, we'll have to go and have a pint or a whiskey in that Scottish pub, whatever it may be, is throw the spotlight on other people because the vast majority of times they will put the spotlight on you. They'll be so flattered you wrote about them that they might mention you in their blog or put a poster up for you in that pub. I don't know, but A, it's engaging content. It's useful content and, you know, local attractions, activities, et cetera, hostelries will be, you know, really flattered that you did that. 
I mean, it's useful for your audience and it's helpful for you and you're supporting your, your people, your people that are, that are also partnering with. And I do that daily in my brief, not to blow my own trumpet here, but I look at what information, even if it's a rival podcast, I'll be like, yeah, you know, that's really good information. I want to share that because my, my audience are going to get value from it. And I think that's the key word again here is like value, education and entertaining, you know, like, like Rob wrote his most overrated attractions or whatever, you know, have some fun with it as well. I mean, he might get in trouble for that. I don't know from the tourist board or whatever. I'm not sure the white house won't call him up, but you know, have fun with it. Yeah. And your local knowledge is really important to consumers. You know, that's really useful. I've got a couple other ideas for, for finding information to the tour operators out there who are Pinterest fans. Same idea with Pinterest. We have travelers that search for travel experiences on Pinterest. I'm one of those people that does that. I go to Pinterest first when I'm deciding where to go next. Pinterest has a suggest, like Google suggests. So same thing, type in a word, don't press return, see what comes up. That's what people are searching for. So that can be a start of another topic. See, I haven't been on Pinterest in forever. I probably should go check it out, right? Because when you say Pinterest, I think MySpace. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they do have a big audience, Shane. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Maybe I'm just not it, but you know, I should go check it out. That's okay. Right. We're looking at ideas okay. that appeal to different people. The TripAdvisor Travel Forum is also really golden because people go in there to ask a question specifically related to travel and you can search by country, by city, and you can see the exact questions that people ask. Also useful. Reddit, of course, also really good for that for questions. So this, I mean, there's, it's limitless, really. Yeah. And it's really proving you're an, you're an authority. If you answer those questions on your own website, your own blog, or on social media, it's showing you're an authority as well as giving value, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So endless amount of places that you can find this information. But then there's the thing about organizing it. Because, and this is what we're getting a little bit into content strategy, right? Because you could basically spend a whole day if you wanted to, or you know, spend a morning or an afternoon and do this. But if you're going to write all these down, all these ideas now, and just make a laundry list, what do you do with that? What do you do with that information? What I like to do is just offer suggestion of how to organize it because you want to be able to use it again. If you wrote a big list down, and and I'll take a particular example of um, one of our tour printers. So Escape Bike Tour and Rentals in Ottawa. She's got a fantastic blog, by the way. She just launched a new website, which is awesome. Take a look at her blog. Because she's made a really good point of organizing her, her type of topics. So say, for example, you are a bike tour operator like her, like Maria, you might get into the habit of always writing about something related to bike tours. But what about all the other stuff? Because it's just easy to write about the things that you like. So how you can organize this information now is just take a simple spreadsheet. If you're an Excel or whatever you like to use, you can do it on a piece of paper and then just make a horizontal line of different themes related to your business. So for example, in Maria's case, she could do a theme about bike tours. Then there could be, the theme could be bike tips, bike equipment, landmarks in Ottawa, and then it could be events or food or what all, like they could be all kinds of different themes. And then just take those ideas that are sort of topics now, and then just put them in the squares below those main themes. So then now you've organized your information into top themes and then the topics within it. And then you just color code it when you've written about or done a video about a particular topic. And then you can kind of see, yeah, you know, I've been writing a lot about events, maybe too many events. Now I need to really focus on some things that are related to our purpose. Like they focus on nature and sustainability. So then you can kind of see in a little graph pretty quickly, a very simple graph. This is not you know, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. This is just really simple. You can see that you've got kind of a, you know, this is your content strategy, essentially. Doreen, I'm listening to you and maybe this is the entrepreneur in me, but I'm thinking maybe you and I need to create a product where our listeners can buy it and get this and just slot in the topics into each of these, these funnels and verticals that you're describing. Maybe, maybe our audience, let us know if you want us to create something like this, that will make it easier for you, a planner for your content. Maybe Doreen and I could make that for you. Sure. But because you're saying it's simple, Mm -hmm. it is simple, but sometimes it's all about time. My point is it sounds simple, but you still have to sit down and create it. Nobody knows how to create this. And I think that's part of the problem with content creation and planning as tourpreneurs most of us don't come from the content world. 
which is why we're producing these episodes, right? But I'm saying what, what you and I, this is something I've learned since episode one of doing Tourpreneur. What you and I think is simple is not always simple for everybody else. My point here is you've now created this big list of different topics that you could write about. All it is is organizing it into buckets. So then you're feeling like you're not always writing about one particular topic versus another. But yeah, maybe there's, yeah. there's something that can help our operators. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let the audience decide. If, if you're listening to this and you would like Doreen and I to come up with something to help you create your content and map it out, let us know because we don't want to do this and nobody wants it. And we won't charge anything silly for it, you know, but just to help you on your way. No, I think that's a really good idea because I do feel the vast majority of us, and I was the same with Torpreneur for a long time, is uh, my content was haphazard. It wasn't, okay, next month I'm going to do week one, an interview with a tourpreneur, week two, talk about Instagram, week three, meet the res tech. It was kind of like, what do I feel like doing today? What do I feel? But now, you know, I'm two years plus in, I have a tremendous amount of feedback from listeners and what they want to hear. Or I can go in the Facebook group and say, hey, you know, what do you want to hear on the show in the coming weeks? And people will say, oh, you should go and interview so-and-so. They've just done whatever it may be. Um, but planning that out is key. Otherwise, things just uh, you know, you just, the content strategy, it, it's just haphazard if you don't think about it in advance. And on saying that, I also feel it's a bit like, and you know this because we're Facebook friends, you know, right now I'm on a 90 day, one hour every morning, cardio, no alcohol, clean eating. And people think I'm crazy, but it, it took probably 21 days and now it's a habit. Now I don't think about doing it. I just get up and I get straight in the gym and do my thing. It doesn't feel like a chore. And it's the same with content creation. You know, for many of us, writing is tough and it's it takes a lot out of us. But I think if you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to write, okay, this might be a bit strong, but a blog post every day or every other day or one a week or whatever it may be, some kind of um, some kind of challenge for yourself. And maybe we should be doing that if we're not leading towards, maybe say, yeah, I'm going to write 12 blog posts in 12 weeks, whatever it may be, and, and get into that habit of creating the content, I think is, is crucial as well, whilst we're not out. Because once we're out leading towards, we might not have that time. And then we'll hopefully have revenue to go hire people to write blog posts for us. But until that happens, you know, we do have the time to create our own content. Yeah, many of us are are not operating right now. We're, we're locked up. So with a coffee one morning, you can just brainstorm a bunch of topics. That's a good place to start now. And then you can buck, put those into buckets. And actually, that's, that's the start of a, a whole content strategy there. So it's just making the time to kind of think through it. And it's overwhelming. I get it. It's overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. The cool thing, though, is once you're into it, and this is some months down the road, it could even be a year down the road, you look at your Google Analytics and say, okay, what are people clicking on? Because one of my biggest lessons in the corporate world when I worked for an OTA in, on the hotel side was I might have an opinion about what will work online. The hotel will have an opinion, but it's the person who clicks or doesn't click that is the most important opinion in the room. So you can go back over your analytics and go, oh, people really love the packing list blog posts that I do every season. Uh, what, what else? Maybe I'll record some video around that now as well, because you can see that the engagement is there rather than a blog post, you know, the five best pubs in Montreal. Maybe they didn't get any attention whatsoever. So, they, okay, people aren't really focused on that. Using those analytics to create your content in the future. Yeah, so there's something that you could do um, pretty easily on looking at your Google Analytics, which Google Analytics, there's a lot of information there. <laughs> it's to navigate through there can be hard sometimes, but one thing you can do is um, look at the content that is doing really well for you. That's that's actually people are landing on and finding your website and then double down on that particular content. So you could go into Google Analytics. So on the left-hand panel there, when you click on behavior, and then you click down on site content and then click down on landing pages, like choose a year or two years in advance, you'll be able to see which blogs people land on. So they're finding you through your blog, not necessarily your homepage or other means. And then so say, for example, if that blog post is the best landmarks in Ottawa, Canada to visit, you could write another article, but go deeper into some of those landmarks and then write separate articles for each of those landmarks that people want to know about. 
that's another good way to make content is double down on what the good, the stuff that's working for you. Absolutely. We talked about FAQs and questions coming in being a gold mine. And so those analytics as well, where you can see where people are landing. It's like, okay, how can I expand on that? I think the other area as well, that's a gold mine is customer reviews. What are people telling you in their reviews that they liked in particular about your activity experience or tour and then write about that, particularly if it's Oh, you know, if you've seen reviews, I really liked it. I'm thinking of a food tour in Montreal we went on. And it was like, oh, I really liked the the pasta place we went to and the story about the grandfather and this, that. You know, go interview him. Write it up. Because if people are telling you that that was the best bit of the tour or they were really moved by something on the tour, go and write more. I mean, you give everything away as such. But I mean, you know, write about that because it's engaging content because people are telling you that. If they're saying your tour guides are really funny, go record some video with your tour guides, you know, have, have some fun with it. The, the thing for me is it comes down to value. Got to make sure the information is valued and not just doing it to, to rank on SEO. Yep. Content has to be first, engaging, interesting content first and helpful content. But that idea that you had about the, the restaurant and the, you know, the Italian family that started the restaurant or whatever the case may be, like, think about the journey that your customers are going on when they're in your city because they're going to go out to eat. They're going to want to do this. They like to do that. They're going to experience that. And if someone finds you through a blog post that happens to be about a restaurant and they're visiting your particular city, maybe they want to do a tour as well. You, you, know, you don't know that. And that's where analytics will help to see what the path that people take on, your, on Google Analytics. But that could be the start of another good piece of content. Yeah. And also when you talk about organizing content, I would also say other than the actual topics and themes, there's three other ways of thinking about it, three other categories. One is seasonal. So for instance, I could write about what to do in Montreal at Christmas time and think about Christmas posts, seasonal. Then you have the evergreen, best way to get from the town center from the airport or whatever it may be. So that's something that's evergreen. And then current content. So right now, and I'm sorry to keep bringing up Rob in DC, but if you think about the troubles DC has had of late, right now, if you visit DC, you can't visit the Capitol because there's fencing all around it or whatever. That's very current content. But I think having those three silos is very helpful as well when you're organizing what to write about. Well, in that same content, I mean, we'll talk in future episodes about redoing your content. So updating your content on a regular basis, people are looking at certain cities and are they open? What's open? What's not open? You could have a blog post that, you know, that's standalone and you update it every week. That actually is, this is what's open now. This is what's not open now. You put a date on it so people know that it's current. Also really, really useful information. I made some other notes here because I was thinking about this that, okay, let's say I'm starting from a blank page. I'm not really sure what to write about. And I kind of broke it down and, and I'll add these to the show notes, which you can find at tourpreneur.com forward slash 145, as well as the other links that Doreen has recommended for us and resources. So, you know, people, you know, who are you? You know, people don't know your company. Why did I start the walking tour of Montreal? Write about the mission and why I'm proud of my city and why I want to show it off to you and why I'm going to show you the best bits. Profiles and features. So by that, like the, the restaurant we stopped off at, the pasta place, go interview the, the grandfather if he's still around and, and write up a little interview with him or create a video. Then you can have day in the life posts. What's the day in the life of a Montreal walking tour guide? Like write it up or again, video it. Then think about the basics. So introductory content, you know, first time visitor to Montreal, how to get around Montreal, uh, what to pack, that kind of thing. And then you can even get into the details on that. So you can do packing this. I know Rob does this, I think for each season, a packing list, or you might want to go in depth on an aspect of your tour or experience. I made a load of notes here. I won't go through all of them, but also, you know, curation, curate useful links and resources for people who are visiting Montreal. You know, they're not just going to come and, you know, your tour might be two, three hours. They're there for three, four days. What else can they go do? And that also comes to the sharing and putting other activities. And maybe there's a really cool bike ride uh, or a cool river tour that you, you know, or a great restaurant, you know, write about them as well. I've seen some really good examples of, of blog posts about just cool neighborhoods to visit in a certain city. I know that kind of content. There's some tour operators that say, well, I don't want to give away all of my secrets of my tour, but inevitably you're someone of an expert in a local market and showing something about a neighborhood, even if it's on your tour is useful information. 
nothing beats personal interaction. I don't care what anyone says. I can see that on a video. I can read about it in a blog post. But when a tour guide points down at a manhole cover in East Berlin and tells me this is where 100 East Berliners escaped to the West, I can read about that in a blog post. I can see when I'm actually stood there and think, wow, that's the moment, you know? So I, I understand where you're coming from, but I wouldn't worry about giving everything, unless you, there's some kind of surprise on your tour, you know, I, I wouldn't share that necessarily, but you can write about so many aspects of your experience. I want to sum up with this. I think when we're writing content, everyone's favorite radio station is We FM. What's in it for me? And you have to write with the reader in mind, not, not with you in mind. And we're all guilty of this as content creators, that we write about stuff that we're interested in and not necessarily thinking about what the listener is interested in uh, or what the reader is interested in. I think it's always important to keep that in mind. It's like, okay, I'm writing for people who are going to be visiting my city. You know, what are they going to be really interested in? How can I be of service to them? How can I offer them value? And it might be just the way that you write. it. So it could still be a topic you're interested in, a topic that a guest would be interested in, but it's the way you write it. So it's not just about you, it's you're talking to them. And that's where using the word you at the beginning of sentences helps a lot. So it's bringing them into the story yeah. or into the content. Yeah. I mean, there are so many ways you can go with creating content. And I really hope with the ideas you've shared today, Doreen, that our listeners, when if they're feeling a little bit stuck in terms of what to write, and how to organize it and how to think about it, that they will listen to this episode. We will listen to this episode. I will listen to this episode when I'm stuck and re-listen to it and say, yeah, that's the inspiration. That's what I'm going to go write about. And that's what we're trying to do here at Tourpreneur is, is educate. Right. And we'll put all these these resources in the in the show notes. So it's yes. easy to refer back to rather than feverishly try to write all these down. Absolutely. And if you go to bloggingfortouroperators.com, uh, I'm creating a microsite within Tourpreneur and you can go there and get all the uh, episodes that Doreen and I are recording. And also we'll add, if we find blog posts that we think would be useful, we'll add those as well. Doreen, where can people find you online? You can find me at travellifemedia.com or you can also join Facebook group. It's called Tourism Marketing That Works. And I post marketing tips every week on there. Love what you do on that group. I'm a big fan. I'm a lurker, but I read all those posts. It's fascinating. I really, I, and I really, again, that's a classic example where there's a lot of tour operator groups out there, but you've gone for that niche. You know what your superpowers are, Doreen, and that's what you're focusing. So when I join your group, I know I'm there for marketing tips, et cetera. So I, I love what you're doing with the group. Well, thank you, Shane. All right. So uh, what, what have we got on the docket for next time? What's the next topic? Yeah, I had repurposing your contents to save time and energy. How about that? Is that good? Love it. That's such an important one for all of us. And I've got something really cool to talk about that I'm doing with Tourpreneur. And we'll talk about that on that episode. So uh, make sure you're subscribed to us using all the podcast apps. Come join us in our Facebook group. If you've got further tips you want to add, or maybe you don't agree with some of these, that's cool as well. We, we love hearing that. Or if you go to tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook, uh, come and join the conversation. Doreen, thank you once again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Tourpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit tourpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Tourpreneur.